Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So first and foremost, I wanted to apologize for my very bare background. Nothing going on back here, but I did just move to a new state and it's been a trek. So I wanted to make sure I was able to record, but I haven't yet had time to set everything up in my apartment. So it might sound a little bit echoey and I didn't really have anything to hang up any of my decorations. So that is why it's completely bare, but I promise I will get everything up and running very soon. And the sound quality should get better and the background will also get better as the next video comes out. If you've been a long time watcher of my channel or if you are a part of my patreon you know that i move basically all the time i actually realized that i have moved four times within the past two years which is kind of crazy and now that my clinical rotations are here i'm going to be moving basically every three months for the next year so i just wanted to let you guys know that my backgrounds are constantly going to be changing everything's going to be changing and it's going to be crazy but um, I'm really excited for this upcoming year of clinical rotations and living in new places and experiencing new things. So just letting you guys know that that's why things are pretty much going to be constantly be changing. I have actually recorded a vlog of me moving, which I will be posting to my Patreon or it might already be up right now, depending on you know, how productive I've been this week with editing and everything like that. I always love posting those types of things to my Patreon. You know, if I go traveling somewhere new or visit somewhere cool or anything like that, I like to post it to my Patreon. So if you are interested in seeing different parts of my life outside of our discussions of true crime, make sure to go ahead and subscribe to my Patreon. So there's my shameless Patreon plug in case any of you guys are interested in seeing what goes on behind the scenes of true crime and everything else that goes on in my wonderful life. I also wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. Ever since I started using GlassesUSA.com, honestly, probably about a year or two ago at this point, my life has gotten so much easier. If you're anything like me, you know how expensive glasses can get and how much of a hassle it can be to get them from the eye doctor. However, it's now so much easier and so much more affordable to get your glasses from GlassesUSA.com. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving your home, all at affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers over 4,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses, including in-home brands like Audido, which is the ones I'm wearing right now, as well as what these ones are. These ones are also Audido and Muse, which is what these ones are. They also have designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Gucci, and so many more. You can find any style and color that you can imagine, as well as specialty glasses like kids' glasses, sports glasses, safety glasses, and more. Also, with GlassesUSA.com, you can add any type of prescription to almost any pair of frames, including sunglasses and blue light blocking glasses, which is what these ones are right here. They also have this really cool try-on feature where you put a picture of yourself to see how your glasses will actually look on you before spending the money to buy them. My boyfriend especially loves this feature. He always uses it every single time he's going to buy a new pair of glasses. It was actually really fun because the other day he put his picture in there and then we scrolled through all of the different styles of glasses and sunglasses and he asked me, you know, do these ones look good? I kind of like these ones. What do you think? You know, it was a lot of fun and it's just fun to see all of these different glasses on you and see how they look and see if you should buy them. It's really cool to be able to try on all of these different glasses without ever leaving your house. And the best part is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $30 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. It's so easy. All you do is enter your prescription online, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders no matter how much money you spend, and if for some reason you aren't completely happy with your order, you have 14 days for a refund, exchange, or 100% store credit, no questions asked. The exciting news is that by clicking the link in my description box below, you can sign up for 65% off of your first pair, which is such an incredible deal considering that their glasses are already so affordable. And if you like any of the glasses that I have shown or the ones that I'm wearing, those links will also be listed down in the description box. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and head to glassesusa.com to get 65% off of your first order. 
Thank you again to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into the video. So the first thing I want to know is that this case does involve themes of intimate partner violence. So if that's something that you're especially sensitive to, or if that's just not something that you are interested in watching, this video may not be for you. I also want to say that this video is one that I feel like everyone's going to have a lot of different opinions on. And honestly, I don't even know what to think. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys have to say in the comments below after the video. I also want to note that I am going to be taking off my glasses for the remainder of this video. I absolutely love wearing my glasses anytime else. I literally wear them pretty much all day, every day at this point, but I know that this glare bothers a lot of people and I've tried a lot of things to try and get rid of it and I don't really know what to do and I'm going to continue trying, but for now I am going to be taking off the glasses for the remainder of this video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the death of Chef Ray Ingram. Ray Ingram was described as being kind-hearted, dedicated, and passionate. Ray loved everything that had to do with cooking and baking, and his passion started at a very young age. When he was only 10 years old, he became interested in baking. He started with Toll House chocolate chip cookies, then eventually went on to take classes in high school for baking pies, cookies, and other sweets. This passion led him to enroll at a two-year program at the Los Angeles Trade Technical College to major in professional baking. Baking. After graduating, he started his careers at Winchell's Donuts in Seal Beach. Then he took his skills to Ralph's Grocery Store. All throughout the 80s, he tried his hand at working at different hotels and country clubs to bake there. But by 2003, he decided that he wanted to take his talents to teaching. So he got a job as a culinary instructor at the OIC Hospitality Training in Indianapolis. A few years after that, he moved back to Bakersfield and taught at the Bakersfield Adult School. Then he went to Las Vegas to help open the Bellagio Hotel and Casino, working along pastry chef Gene Philippi. By the time he was 48 years old, he worked as a pastry chef at the Petroleum Club of Bakersfield and made amazing desserts that everybody absolutely loved. At the same time, he did continue teaching at Bakersfield College. Students who had him described him as being an amazing and inspiring teacher. He was always so calm and understanding while always encouraging his students to learn more and do better. One student explained that there was times that she would get frustrated at her work in his class, but he would always say something like, it's not perfect, but don't worry about it. It doesn't mean it's bad. You just have more to learn. And that's the fun part. Other students said that he was extremely knowledgeable about pastries and did whatever he could to help his students succeed. They described him as being a huge inspiration to them who influenced their lives greatly. By 2016, Ray lived out his dream of owning his own restaurant and he purchased Jay's Place from their previous owners. Jay's Place is a Southern style comfort food restaurant that was loved by many. And even when he was the owner of his own restaurant, his coworker said that he was an absolute joy to be around. When he was in the kitchen, he was constantly cracking jokes and having a good time. He never took himself too seriously, even in serious situations. He always made those working around him feel at ease and he was just a breeze to work with. He was also pretty religious and made it known by everybody around him that he knew that he was lucky to own his own business and be able to do what he loved. Now, Ray Ingram had been dating a woman named Mikhail Bowers at the time of his death and he had been with her for 25 years at that point. They even had a child together and by all accounts, Ray was a great father to this child. Now, over the course of their 25-year relationship, she had asked him for marriage several times, but he had always said no, despite them being together for 25 years and even having a child together. This may have been because he had actually been unfaithful to Mikhail and started seeing another woman in 2009 and then had a child with her in 2013, all of which he kept a secret from her for a very long time. However, the entire time that him and this other woman were together, this woman asked him, over and over again to tell Mikhail about their relationship and repeatedly asked him to end things with her, but he didn't. Now, he did stay involved in the child's life, the child that belonged to this other woman, but he did not tell Mikhail about anything. So this other woman took it upon herself to let Mikhail know everything that was going on. In 2016, she had apparently written
written her a letter and also spoke to her on the phone and told her everything. But despite this, Ray and Mikkel talked it out and they decided to stay together. They came up with an arrangement where he was going to still be involved with this other child's life, but he was not to be romantically involved with this woman anymore. But Mikkel never really trusted Ray and she always had the feeling that he was still seeing this other woman. Now, it was thought but never proven that she was actually tracking his phone to keep tabs on where he was going. Now, again, this had never actually been confirmed that she had done this, but either way, her suspicions were eventually confirmed a few days after Valentine's Day in 2017. On February 18th of that year, 51-year-old Mikhail had discovered a receipt from the Vons grocery store showing that Ray had actually bought two identical sets of gifts for Valentine's Day. The receipt showed two mega mugs, two flower arrangements, and two balloons. Of course, this made Mikhail extremely angry. She thought that this relationship was over, and not only was she finding out that it wasn't, but he literally bought the two women the exact same gifts for Valentine's Day. So on February 22nd, Mikkel took a picture of that receipt and sent it to Ray at 5.01 a.m. to show him that she knew that he was being unfaithful to her once again. So Ray had texted her back saying, put all my stuff in the bag, my receipts. I'm dropping all of your stuff off this morning. No conversation needed. Basically, it seemed like he was ending the relationship for good and wanted to come over and get all of his stuff. After this, she had called him several times and the two were arguing back and forth for about an hour before Ray decided to just go to her house, get some of his items back, and then give her back her belongings. He arrived at her house at 6.06 .06 a.m. However, once he got there, the two started arguing again, and this argument escalated very quickly. Now, what exactly happened in this argument has two sides, which we will go over in just a minute. However, what we do know is that around five minutes later at 6.11 a.m., police were called to send medical help. Mikhail had called 911 asking that medical help come to her home, stating that there had been an altercation and that she needed police. She would not say anything else other than that and just hung up the phone. 911. I, I, I have an emergency here at my home. Do you need police or medical? Uh, both. Okay, what's going on? There was an altercation. I just need the police. If anybody can call, please come right now. Okay, what's going on, ma'am? Just please bring the police. Okay, thank you. You need to give me more information. So, police headed over to the house on the 5,000 block of McKee Road in Bakersfield to find out what happened since McKeel didn't really give them any information to go off of. When they got there though, they saw that Ray Ingram had been dead inside of Mikhail's home. He was found laying face down in the entryway to her bedroom with a single gunshot wound to his neck. It was clear that Mikhail had shot Ray. She had even used her own gun, which was registered to her, to shoot him. But what happened leading up to the shooting and what exactly caused it is not totally clear. Police who arrived first on the scene reported that when they got there, Mikhail was hunched over as if she was in pain or stressed or upset. Police asked her what happened and she immediately said, I just shot my child's father. So of course, immediately police arrested her and charged her for the shooting. So this case went to trial in April of 2019. The prosecution was asking for a charge of first degree murder. However, the defense claimed that this shooting was an accident and it was in self-defense. So let's get into what each side argued for this case. So the prosecution argued that after the discovery of this receipt for Valentine's Day, Mikhail was so upset and angry that she came up with this plan to kill Ray. They said that this was a domestic violence case, but that Mikhail was the aggressor. They discussed all of the events leading up to the shooting, how she had this long history of being cheated on and her thinking that this relationship was over. They discussed how she had always wanted to get married to Ray, but he never wanted to. They discussed that she was always tracking him and always keeping tabs on him. Then of course, they discussed the discovery of this other woman having a child with Ray and how she thought this relationship was over only to find out that it continued. Of course, finding out all of this is incredibly heartbreaking and upsetting. They said that this was enough for her to want to kill Ray over his infidelity. The evidence they used, of course, was that the same day that she had killed Ray, she sent this picture of the receipt to him. He replied basically saying to just get all this stuff so that they could officially end things. They argued for a while and then he finally came over. The prosecution argued that after this argument had broke out, Mikhail ran 
went into the bedroom and grabbed her gun. They then say that she waited in the corner of her room and just waited for him to come after her and then shot him. Then after shooting him, she called 911 on herself to report it. Now, some people might say that calling 911 is a sign that this totally was an accident and she called on herself and if this was on purpose, she wouldn't have called 911 to report it. But we all heard that 911 call. I think that was the shortest call that I've ever heard. She didn't sound panicked. She didn't sound like she was freaking out and she wouldn't even give details about what happened. There was no real urgency in this call. It was obvious to me as I was listening that she really didn't care whether he lived or died. All she really said was that they needed medical help. She didn't tell them that there was someone who was just shot and was going to die if someone didn't get there quick. She didn't even mention anybody getting shot in the first place. She wouldn't even answer the questions from the dispatcher. She just hung up on them. So that was a big piece of evidence that they had used against her. Now, Mikhail took the stand and said that she really didn't care about Ray's infidelity. So this was her arguing that she wouldn't have shot him because she was jealous because she really didn't care that he was seeing another woman. But Mikhail's sister took the stand and said that she was absolutely devastated by Ray's infidelity, as any woman would be. The other part of the evidence was where she shot him. You would think that if this was in self-defense, you wouldn't be shooting to kill. You would shoot them in the arm or the leg or maybe even in the chest. But she went straight for the neck and maybe even the head if you can assume that her aim just may not have been perfect. You can't always assume that where someone was shot was exactly where the person intended to shoot them because most people don't have a perfect shot especially if they're not trained with a gun. So you could argue this both ways. You could say that she was probably aiming for the chest or the arm and that her aim just wasn't very good, so she happened to shoot him in the neck. Or for the sake of the prosecution, they could argue that she was aiming straight for the head. But whether she tried to hit his head or neck or chest or arm or wherever, the other part of this was the distance from where she shot him. There was quite a bit of distance between him and her when she shot him. He wasn't actively attacked her. He wasn't even very close to her to get up to her and start attacking her. He was standing at the doorway of the bedroom, unarmed when he was shot. So that can show that she wasn't technically in immediate danger. Then we have to talk about the time frame in which he was shot. He arrived at the home at 6.06 a.m. and literally five minutes later, Mikhail was on the phone with the police. So that means that she must have shot him less than five minutes after he came over. It's kind of hard to believe that within that very small time frame, the two had started talking and then that escalated to an argument and then some sort of altercation broke out, so much so that she felt like her life was in danger and then ran over to her bedroom, grabbed her gun, and then him chase after her so much so again that she felt like her life was in danger and then she turns around and accidentally shoots him before getting up and then calling 911. That could be possible, but it just does not seem very probable. It could be argued that it's more probable that in that span of five minutes, she was sort of waiting for something to happen so that she could shoot him. Again, because she was so angry at him. Lastly, I want to talk about her behavior after police arrived. She said, I shot my children's father. That can definitely be seen as something that someone says when they're just in complete shock and disbelief at what just happened. But the way she said it was just a little bit strange. You would think that someone who had just shot the father of their child from fearing from their own life, you would think that they would be a little bit more panicked or frantic. Of course, you can always say that people respond to situations differently, but I do feel like this was just a little bit strange for how she acted. The prosecution argued all of these points as evidence towards her planning the shooting because of jealousy and rage. He said, quote, there are millions of women throughout the world that have to deal with infidelity but you can't just kill someone. You can't just shoot the guy because he wouldn't marry you. He strung you along with another woman. But the defense came back with a completely different argument. They argued that this entire thing was the result of long-term abuse at the hands of Ray Ingram. They said that Ray had continuously abused Mikhail for years. They said that over the years, Ray had kicked, punched, and verbally belittled Mikhail. He said that him engaging in other relationships and having a child with another other woman is just another thing that Ray did to hurt Mikhail. They argued that on the morning of the shooting, Ray took a 
a step further and this time he threatened Mikhail's life. They said that the two had gotten into this argument in which the two had yelled at each other and then they got into such an altercation that they actually knocked over a vase, which they did see at the crime scene. And then Ray yelled, I'm going to kill you, B, and then tried to punch her. Then Mikhail ran to her bedroom to escape Ray from beating her and then grabbed her gun, closed the door to lock herself in the room, then hid in the corner and clutched her gun close to her chest. They said that in that moment, she was absolutely terrified of what he would do to her and she genuinely believed that he was going to kill her. Then as Ray rushed after her, he swung the door open and Mikhail was startled. So as she was turning around, she fired off one shot by accident and accidentally killed him before he got the chance to beat her. Then she called police on herself because she had absolutely nothing to hide. She was an abused woman who just had to defend her life. She was still in shock and disbelief and was trying to understand what happened herself. So that's why she didn't stay on the phone for very long. The defense said, quote, she used a firearm to defend herself. We need to send a message. And that message is you need to be able to protect yourself in your own home. So one of the biggest things that supported this argument was a psychologist who testified at court. He said that after evaluating Mikhail, he diagnosed her with PTSD after she had suffered long-term abuse. Additionally, two of Mikhail's sons, one of which was Ray's child and the other was from a previous relationship took the stand to testify that the two were basically constantly arguing. And they said that they had witnessed physical abuse at the hands of Ray. They said that there were several instances in which they witnessed him slapping her and several times where they saw him kicking down the front door because she wouldn't let him in. So this definitely supports the fact that she may have gone into a room to hide from him and then he just swung open the door, kicked it open to force himself into her bedroom. But I will also note that before the trial, police had spoken to Ray and Mikhail's adult son, and before, he said that he had never witnessed any form of abuse. I don't know if this was just something that was reported differently among articles or if this truly was a discrepancy, but because of this, it seems like for whatever reason, the story changed. So to me, that just doesn't seem like the most credible testimony just because again, it was changed. Now, normally this is something that I definitely would believe. If a child came out and said like, yeah, I saw my dad hitting my mom, I would probably believe that kid but because the testimony was changed, I just don't know what to think about this. And other than this, there is no actual physical evidence of domestic abuse, but there are a few things that can support this theory. So to me, looking at all of the evidence in this case, I do think that it's possible that he was abusive towards her, at least in some sort of way. Now, I do think that it's possible that he was physically abusing her, but there's no actual evidence of it. So for now, I'm just going to make the argument that it's possible that he was verbally and emotionally abusing her. Again, we can always make the argument that he was physically abusing her, but because there's no real reports, there was never any documented injuries, anything else like that, it's hard to actually make that argument when there's no evidence. But I do think that there could be some evidence of a verbal and emotional abuse. So that's what I'm going to talk about for now, just for the sake of this argument. First, of course, we know that he was cheating on her. That, in my opinion, is one of the worst things that you can do to someone, hands down. Being cheated on is one of the absolute worst feelings and nobody deserves to go through that. And not only did he cheat on her, but he had a child with another woman. Then he promised that the affair was over, only to continue seeing her behind her back. That is incredibly hurtful. So at that point, you have to ask yourself, why would she stay with him to begin with? She stayed for years and years after finding out that he cheated. And just being a woman who has woman's intuition and being a woman who has stayed with exes for way too long after they did something pretty bad, I just feel like she knew the entire time. Again, it's just women's intuition. And maybe that's a terrible argument, but just bear with me for a second. I feel like almost every woman and maybe even men can agree that once you find out your partner is cheating on you, especially if it was this very long-term relationship, which they held behind your back for many years and they went as far as him having a child with her, 
chances are he's not actually going to stop seeing her just because you ask him to. And even if he says he did, chances are he was still exhibiting some behaviors that she probably knew that he was still cheating. I don't think she was completely oblivious at all all. It just makes me wonder why she would stay with someone who was cheating on her and who was lying to her. Again, this is making the assumption that she just had a woman's intuition and knew that he was cheating on her still. You could argue that the reason that she stayed was because they had a child together, but at the point that all of this happened, he was an adult at the time. There wasn't really any reason that she wanted to stay with him just for the sake of a young child. And the two weren't even living together, so it's not like she was trapped in this house and couldn't leave or that she was depending on him financially because I didn't really see anywhere that he was financing any of her life and it's not like she just stayed for convenience and was like i already live in this house i don't really feel like moving all my stuff and starting a new life it's just easier for me to stay here so let's just hope that he stops this relationship with this other woman i don't think that that was it at all it makes me wonder if she at that time was in such a low mental state that she felt like she deserved nothing better again bear with me but pretty much anybody who's just constantly belittled and talked down to and is always told that they're worthless will eventually start to believe it. And that is proven in so many other cases of domestic abuse. It's very, very common for women to stay with men who abuse them simply because these men truly make them believe that they are absolutely worthless. Not to veer off of this case too far, but I do want to take a moment to say that a lot of people question, you know, why did she stay with him if he was cheating? Why did she stay with him if he was abusing her? Why did she stay with him if he was calling her all of these nasty things and making her feel so horrible? It's because some people, whether you're man or woman, if you're constantly being told that you're worthless, you are eventually going to believe it. If you're constantly being talked down to, if you are constantly being made to feel like you deserve nothing better, you will eventually start to believe that you deserve nothing better. That's why so many people stay in abusive relationships. That's how the cycle happens. But either way, in Mikhail's case, if she was being abused verbally and belittled and was being cheated on, she could have really just felt stuck. She could have felt so low that she just felt like she had to stay with him. Sure, they didn't live together, they weren't married, but that doesn't mean that he didn't have the power to make her feel worthless over those over 20 years that they were together, so much so that he made her feel like there was nothing else that she could do. If he really was talking down to her and verbally abusing her, she may have started believing everything that he had to say and genuinely thought that her life would never get better and that she would find nobody better. Because again, in these abusive relationships, the abuser will always say, you know, you aren't going to find anybody better than me. You won't find anybody that will do the things that I do for you. You will never have anybody who will love you ever again. And again, it gets to a point where they start believing their abuser. Then, after years of emotional trauma and just constantly being cheated on, maybe Mikkel felt like she had just had enough and was finally confronting him with this receipt. Maybe she finally decided that it was time that she needs to do better for herself. Sure, she was probably completely devastated that he cheated and was continuing to cheat, but that doesn't mean that she killed him. She could have been upset over those couple of days from when she found the receipt to where she actually confronted him that she realized she needed to end it for good. Most people will reach a point where they stop believing their abuser finally after so long and finally realize that they do deserve better. So maybe the morning that the two argued, he said, fine, I'm coming over and I'm getting my stuff from your place. And then he came over and they continued arguing. Then maybe he finally realized that she wasn't taking his crap anymore. Maybe he came to the realization that he doesn't have the power he once had over her. It can be very scary when a victim finally goes to their abuser 
abuser and says, you're not doing this to me anymore. I know what I deserve and that's better than you. Again, just for the sake of this argument, we know that Ray was the one who said that he was gonna come over to get his stuff and that no more conversation was needed. But maybe he didn't really wanna end things. Again, we can see over these 25 years that he was cheating on her, he probably didn't wanna end things. So maybe when she finally said, no, you're not getting me back, this isn't going to continue. I don't deserve to be cheated on anymore. He realized that he was finally going to lose her for good. Then maybe everything happened exactly the way the defense described. They got into this argument and maybe he realized that he no longer had the power in this relationship. So he threatened to kill her because she decided that she didn't want him anymore. And he decided that if he couldn't have her, then nobody else could. So maybe after he threatened her life, she was just terrified. So she went to go hide with her gun with no intention of shooting him maliciously but when he kicked open the door she was terrified and pulled the trigger without even realizing it at first she could have been so terrified for her life that she genuinely did not realize what she was doing in that moment i think that that's kind of the only way to explain this whole accident thing that it was an accident and not just purely self-defense i do think that it's possible if she had her gun and was just clutching her gun against her you know obviously hoping that she doesn't have to use it, hoping that he doesn't actually try to hurt her and that maybe he just leaves and goes away and leaves her alone. That when he kicked open the door, she swung around and just pulled it and didn't even think about it. Didn't think about it first and it just happened. I think that's the only way that it can really be explained as an accident. Then, like I said, she could have just been in complete shock when she called 911 and when police arrived, and that's why she didn't say much, and that's why her behavior was a little bit off. I'm sure if this is exactly how it went down, I'm sure it was such a strange feeling. On one hand, she's upset because her boyfriend of over two decades is now dead because of her. She just took away a father from her child. But then on the other hand, she knows that this abuse is going to stop. So I'm sure in that moment, she was experiencing a ton of mixed emotions and just didn't know how to feel or register all of it at the time. We know that she said, I just killed my children's father, which definitely points to her feeling bad. Again, she knows that she took a child's father away from him, but she finally can feel relieved that this abuse is going to stop and that maybe she can find someone who's gonna treat her right. So that's basically the main argument for the defense. Again, they said that she killed him after he had threatened to kill her. So this entire thing was in self-defense. So after three weeks of trial, both the defense and the prosecution made their closing statements and the jury went into deliberation. The jury actually deliberated for three days before they came back as a hung jury. They could not reach a unanimous vote. It was 11 to one in favor of second degree murder. So so because of this, the judge declared a mistrial. A new trial date was set and this time the trial was for February of 2020. During this trial, they basically argued the same points on both sides. The prosecution maintained that Mikhail had planned this entire thing and planned to kill Ray once he arrived at her home. The defense argued that she had suffered long-term abuse and that this entire thing was just an accident. The jury basically heard the same arguments before they went into deliberation. And once again, a mistrial trial was declared. The jury came back this time with four different verdicts between the 12 jurors. Six of them voted for voluntary manslaughter, four of them for second degree murder, one for involuntary manslaughter, and one for not guilty. It was absolutely crazy, but this case was just such a difficult one that nobody, not even the people who heard every single bit of evidence, could really decide what actually happened. So once again, a new date was set for yet another trial. This time it was set for August of 2020. However, by September of 2020, the Kern County District Attorney, Cynthia Zimmer, announced that Mikhail Bowers had actually agreed to a plea deal of voluntary manslaughter. Because of the plea, she was sentenced to six years behind bars. This same plea was presented to her a few times during the other trials, but every single other time she had turned it down. She didn't want to plea to something that would lend her any jail time if she had the possibility of a jury finding her not guilty. But after two long trials that both ended in a hung jury, this seemed like her best bet. Cynthia Zimmer came out about the plea and said, quote, 
the district attorney's office is cognizant of how incidents of domestic violence can impact relationships. Two current county juries considering this case struggled with the potential of previous domestic violence within the relationship and what impact it may have had on the defendant's actions. After two juries were unable to reach a unanimous verdict on the charge of murder, an agreement was reached whereby Bowers acknowledged her role in the unlawful death of Mr. Ingram by entering a plea of voluntary manslaughter and will be sentenced to six years in a state prison as a result. So that's pretty much where the case ends. I know that you guys are going to have so many different mixed opinions on this. This case really did start a bit of an uproar from those who truly believe that she's innocent. In October of 2020, a national advocacy group protested in front of the courthouse to advocate for survivors of domestic abuse. One of Mikhail's sons, who was not fathered by Ray, was at the protest and said, quote, During both trials, the prosecutor could not provide credible witnesses against my mother, but has stated that my mother was indeed a victim of domestic violence. However, the prosecutor insists on keeping my mother incarcerated and has shown much zeal and commitment in continuing to prosecute her despite two mistrials. This is an apparent example of coercion that ultimately pushed my mother to accept a plea deal. But of course, others believe that her accepting a plea deal is showing that she accepts the penalty for an unlawful killing, knowing that she would be in jail for six years. By doing so, she acknowledges that she did not kill him in self-defense. So there are really mixed opinions on this and honestly, I don't even know really what to think. Now, I do think that the prosecution may have gone in too hard with trying to get first degree murder. I don't think that this was first degree murder, even if you account for everything, even if everything the prosecution said was true, I still don't think it's necessarily first degree murder. And I think them going for that was a pretty big mistake. I think the most that they should have argued was second degree murder because it's more likely that she killed him in the heat of an argument and was upset during the argument than it is that she planned this out, invited him over, was about to shoot him and all that. I don't think that that's as likely as her killing him out of rage during this argument. So I do think that the prosecution made a very big mistake in that aspect. For anybody who believes that she's totally guilty, I do think that the prosecution is at least a little bit responsible for not getting that verdict. Then I also want to talk about the plea deal that she took. I don't necessarily think that that's her saying like, yes, I know I did this and I'm accepting the charges because I know that I'm guilty. Again, it was presented to her many, many times throughout the other trials and she never took it until she realized that she already went through all of this stress and trauma of two very long trials, both of which ended in a hung jury. So I think at that point she realized that taking all these trials probably isn't going to help her. So she might as well just plead to something and just take what she gets from that. That is so much easier than going through all of these different trials and possibly being in jail for the rest of your life for something that you didn't do. I'm not saying that I think she's completely innocent, but I don't think that her taking this plea deal is her saying that she's totally guilty either. I think that if she took it right from the very beginning, the first day and said, I don't wanna to go to trial, I just wanna take this plea deal, I think that maybe that can look a little bit more guilty, but she went through all of these trials. She went through all of this stress. She sat in jail hoping that she would get acquitted for this. So I do think that that at least does show that she believes that she's innocent. Now, as for what I think really happened, I do think that if we strictly consider the evidence that we can see, I do think that it points more towards Mikhail being upset and killing him because of that. Again, while being cheated on absolutely sucks and it's one of the worst feelings ever, it doesn't mean that you get to kill somebody. But then on the other hand, it is really, really difficult to prove intimate partner violence. All of it happens behind closed doors and abusers make it a point to only abuse them behind closed doors because they don't want anybody else knowing what's happening. We've seen so many cases where everything in a relationship seems perfectly fine on the surface to other people, but when you look behind closed doors, there was actually a lot of abuse going on. I also want to note that we don't know all of the evidence presented at trial. I told you guys everything that I was able to find and I know that it's not even close to all of the actual evidence that was presented. I couldn't find any actual court documents or anything stating all of the evidence that they presented, I solely went based off of articles that was written about this case. But even then, the people who did actually hear all of the evidence 
couldn't even come up with a verdict. So to me, that is very telling. In most cases, I would say that six years for taking somebody's life isn't even close to fair. And honestly, when I first started researching this case, I thought the same thing. It made me really angry initially knowing that this woman took someone's life and is only serving six years. But in this specific case, I do think that it's fair because we don't truly know what happened. If she did kill him out of rage and jealousy, at least she's serving some time for it. If she killed him out of self-defense or if it truly was an accident, at least she's not spending her entire life in jail. I know that neither is ideal, but there's so much doubt in this case that I do think that's the fairest outcome. I think that it could have been so many different combinations of so many different factors in this case. I do think that it's possible that Ray was a great person in his professional life. I think he was a great teacher and a great coworker, but clearly, he had a lot of personal issues that he was dealing with that weren't so great. No matter how good of a person you are in every other aspect of your life, cheating is never okay. I think putting someone through that is absolutely horrible. I personally think that he strung Mikhail along because he didn't want her to be with anybody else, but he wasn't dedicated enough to only be with her. I think that's really unfair and selfish, and that in and of itself can completely destroy someone's self-image and self-esteem. No, it's not an excuse to kill someone, but again, we really don't know what happens behind closed doors, and in this case, we probably never will. Again, in cases of intimate partner violence, we need to realize that there's so many things that we just don't know. So many things can be going on behind closed doors that nobody else besides the two people involved in that relationship know about. So. I am going to end the video there, but I do want you guys to keep that in mind as you're coming up with all of your different theories. So now I want to know what your guys' thoughts and theories are. Please let me know down in the comments below. Do you think that this really was a case of self-defense? Do you think that it was an accident? Do you think that it happened exactly the way the defense described? Do you think that it happened exactly how the prosecution described? Do you think that it could be a total combination of different things? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below, but I do also want to say, please be respectful towards both parties. We don't truly know. I don't want anybody trash talking Mikhail. I don't want anybody trash talking Ray. Please keep everything civil and appropriate in the comments. I don't want to hear any personal attacks against anybody involved because again, we don't know what happened. These are all just theories on what we think happened. But if you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and click the link down below and head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first order. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Every single case that I cover here on this channel comes directly from that email. So please don't hesitate to send those suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.